So we're going to wrap up the last, it's a great segue to introduce uh, Jordan, who's a social worker, who's going to actually engage us in all of us participating and perhaps telling our story. Hello, hi, uh, my name is Jordan Chavez. I'm a social worker with the Urologic Oncology Department here at Stanford. Um, I see some familiar faces. How many people is this their first time at this conference? Oh, good. That's, good. that's enough of a new audience for me that you won't have heard my jokes before. Um, so I got moved into this prime time slot here at the end of your day, um, but I promise we're still gonna get you out of here on time. Um, my role here at Stanford and as a social worker is to work on the non-medical pieces of what happens when you get cancer. Um, so all day you've had all these talks about um, what to do for your body, the whole, you know, what research is new and what treatment you can get and all of that. And the thing that, the reason they have social workers here at Stanford is because we acknowledge that with a diagnosis of cancer comes all sorts of other things that have nothing to do with your physical body or your medical status or anything like that. So that's what we're gonna talk about for this last little bit here um, before you guys wrap up. Um, because we don't have a ton of time, I'm kinda just jump right in um, and kinda get us started. But what I would like to do, and I know that everybody hates it when I make them stand up and move around, um, but I'm gonna do it anyway. How many caregivers do we have here? Perfect, patients? Other? Okay. So what I'd really like to do, if you don't mind, is to have everybody stand up, have patients, people who have a diagnosis of kidney cancer, come up to this area of the room here, and caregivers, friends, miscellaneous, people who are just here for the food, um, to come to this back corner here. Just real quick, you don't have to... Mm. You sit in the middle. You don't have to bring your stuff. There's no notes. Nobody's going to steal your phone. We'll just move around real quick. Patients, patients over here, caregivers and the rest kind of in this, in this back cluster over there. Okay, so what I, would, what I want to do and what I try to do, this is my fourth year um, at this conference, and what I try to do every year here is that you guys have been talked at all day. Um, and you've been able to ask questions and that kind of thing. But the, the truth is that there's a wealth of knowledge and information on how we get through the non-medical, non-physical parts of this disease in this room here. So much better than me giving you a presentation on how to do that because you're all already doing it, I want to facilitate us being able to talk about that together. So for this year, what I'd like to talk about is the hardest thing. What is the hardest thing? about this diagnosis. And I want you to think back to the, to the moment that you first thought you were sick, through the moment when you found out that this was your diagnosis or, your, or the person that you're here with diagnosis, through your treatment, your surgeries, through all of those things. And it could be many, many, many years of this for some of you, or it could be months or weeks. I have no idea um, who's in the room here. But I want you to think about for a second, what is the hardest thing that has happened? And then I want you to think about, maybe that was way back five years ago when you got diagnosed and the hardest moment was when your doctor walked in the room with that look on their face and you knew for sure that something was wrong. Maybe that was the hardest moment. And maybe that moment has long since passed and you've moved on, you've done all this other stuff. So in addition to the hardest thing that has happened the whole way, I want you to think about what the hardest thing is now, today, this week, whatever, in, in, recent, in recent time. And I want our caregivers and our family members to do the exact same thing. What has been the hardest thing for you about watching somebody go through this, about hearing that this has happened to somebody that you care about, about taking care of them? And then what remains the hardest thing now? And what I'd like to do is just break down no formal way, whoever's right around you, and just talk for five, ten minutes about within your group what that is. And then we're going to kind of pull it back together because what I'm really interested to hear is what are the things that we didn't think about being hard that are hard for some people? And what are the things that seem to be hard for everybody? Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how you made it through that. And then by that time, we'll be done. So I'm going to circle around. Just find a few people near you, four or five people. Turn your chairs, whatever it is. The hardest thing. That's what I want to know about. OK, I want to pull us back together here. 
I hate to stop a talking room. This is a rule that I don't usually break, but since time is of the essence, I'm going to stop you guys. Thank you for being willing to share so freely, just walking around. Obviously, people have a lot to say, a lot of thoughts on this. No, sit wherever you are is fine. That's fine. OK. So the first thing I want to ask is, did anybody say anything that surprised you? Or was everything exactly what you would think? It's the same as what's hard for you. Did anybody say anything that surprised you about what's been hard for them? No. Yeah. Do we have another mic? Yeah, let's hear you. Did you want to say something? If you want to share. Well, she, she, she said that she's surprised of, as to what I said, so I'll just... And we'll put you on the spot. So what did no, you say? Um, when I was diagnosed, um, within a, a, a month, I had a, a, a procedure, I had surgery. So I was very quick to try to find a solution. But in that interim month, uh, discussing it with my adult daughters, they had a different take as to what the solution or treatment or protocol should be. They were more of the Eastern medicine approach, non-surgical, non-Western medicine, and trying to bridge the gap between the two was difficult for us as a family to get through so that there was a common understanding and, and common buy-in to that. So that, yeah. was, that, right. was, that was hard. Okay. Yeah, I'll take that one back and that one will float around. Anything else surprise you of what, what people had to say? So, so here's the thing, I, I'm not surprised that you weren't surprised, right? Because we tend to worry about the same things. And I heard the same words as I walked around and around. And it doesn't mean that the experience isn't different for every person um, that you know, feels uncertainty or feels hopeless or feels fear um, or feels frustration or sadness. It doesn't mean that that doesn't manifest differently for each of us. But the fact is that we often use the same words to describe what is so hard about this. Um, would a couple of people be willing to share, you know, it, did somebody in their group articulate something in a way that was particularly poignant or well said about what, what has been so hard about this? And I, and I really do want to include our, the, the caregiver realm over here too, because one of the things that does sometimes surprise us is that what is hard for patients is hard for caregivers, and what is hard for caregivers is hard for patients, because we often spend a lot of time worrying about each other. Um, so. Just a couple, a couple people who'd be willing to say what has been particularly hard for them. You were all chatterboxing like <laughs> four minutes ago, which is why I hate to stop people from talking because I know that I'll get crickets after, but I know that somebody's willing to. You're gonna make me call on a staff member, really? <laughs> all right, Tommy, go ahead. So one of the people in our group actually articulated something um, very well, I thought. He mentioned that his wife, who he has been married to for 45 years, has always been very active. Um, and with her on treatment, at times, she loses that energy. And it is difficult for him to watch her not be able to do the things that she previously loved to do and the things that made her really happy. And that's a long time to know somebody and to see them yeah. experience their life every single day and then have that suddenly change. And I thought that was very poignant. Right. Right. And even we push that a step further, right? And, and we look at this person and we wonder who they are. You know, on some days they don't look like the person that, that we know. I regret going to say anything, but I know the, the side effects of the medication So just physically managing, just just managing the physical part yeah. all by itself. Anybody else who hasn't already talked for 45 minutes today? <laughs> <laughs> Come on.
Come on. W one more person. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I had my left kidney removed in um, October of 2008, and I been around the block a few times by now, and I've been on all those TKIs, and I've had a little bit of radiation, which I did not enjoy. Um, but I guess the hardest thing, that, you know, it, and it, it just doesn't go away, is the fact that with mo most kidney cancers and most of us, you know, you're not going to get, we're not going to get better. You know, it's it, as fabulous as hair you can get around here, and um, and I have a wonderful family and a wonderful husband, and a, I've got everything I need. But it's not like if I do everything right, I'm going to get better. I'm not. And so that you know that realization catches up with me every so often. And of course, when you're on these medications and you feel so crony anyway, you know, why am I, this is like no fun. Um, so that, I, I think that's the hardest because it's hard and the hardest because it's not gonna change. So that's my deal. Anybody else? Getting brave? All right. So, so let me let me say what I heard as I walked around because I, I know that these are words from you. And just to pick up right off that point, that there's no cure. That's a pretty hard thing. And the one of the words I heard was that there that it feels hopeless. Um, so as well as we can do, we feel hopeless because at the end of the day, we this is this is probably gonna be it for us. Um, so that's that's a really hard thing going right hand in hand with that, right, is, is uncertainty. When? When is it gonna stop? When is this treatment gonna stop working? When is my scan gonna come back bad? When am I going to stop feeling better? Like you feel worse and worse and worse, and then you feel better, right? And then you feel worse again, and then you feel better, right? And we do this for months and years. When, when am I not gonna go back up again? Um, so that's a very uncertain thing. And right along with hopelessness is hope. If I can make it long enough, will somebody figure something out? Um, so these are all things that I heard walking around the room here, right? So there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of hopelessness, and there's a lot of very cautious hope. If I can do well enough, if I can follow the research, if I can see the right doctors, if I can get the right surgery and be on the right treatment, I could be here long enough to die of something else <laughs> or for somebody to figure out something that's gonna help me. And maybe it's not a cure, but maybe it's the next drug, right? Or maybe it's the next treatment, or whatever it is. And all those ibs and all those fancy new things are still new, right? So we don't know. We don't know what they're gonna be. So what do we do with those hard things? We just sit around in dark corners with them, don't come out to events like this. What do you do? How do you get through the day? Do you not think about it? Back about a year ago, when I met with someone mm -hmm. um, here at Stanford, they said, you've got to start thinking about the disease in a different paradigm. You've got to start thinking about managing it, like you manage diabetes, you manage HIV, you manage some of these things that you could die, these diseases you can die of too. Right. So that started a whole different um, realm of thinking and, and how you approach it. I mean, I, I have to say, I, I've been lucky so far. I haven't gone through some of the, the, the issues that many people here have gone through. Um, but I know that many of them will be possibly in the future. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of hope. Yeah. yeah. So thinking about it, 
as a, as a more chronic disease, which is what I heard you just say, right? Something that we can manage over a long period of time. And sure, ultimately, it may be the thing that, that, it, that kills us, but that, that could be years and years and years away and imagine what we could get done in all that time. So looking at it that way, as opposed to uh, an immediate death sentence, like tomorrow I won't be here because of this. What else do we do? What else do you do? What else in the back corner, not including anybody who works here, do do? You think about other things. Distraction, right? Yeah. It's a great technique. Distraction, denial, very helpful things to do. Seriously, right? We think about these as, as very, denial is your friend, right? People think of these as like negative coping mechanisms, denial, distraction. We need to accept things. We need to confront them. No, we get. We need some. We need to put our mind on something else sometimes. Absolutely, we got to find something else to think about. What else? <coughs> I had an interesting one. Ever since I had this cancer, I was given six months, except my doctor here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she said nothing's going to happen to you. Yeah, it's like a diabetic, uh, medication control it, not going to cure it, but medication is going to control it, you're going to mm -hmm. be fine. And I've been here for five years. So, so what do you do? You get a real stubborn doctor who refuses. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Who refuses to believe that that's the case. What else? What else do you do? Type or type, uh, diabetes now. Uh, I had uh, stage four, and as of April, uh, there's no evidence of disease, so I'm still on the sedutinib, mm -hmm. which is great. So I feel, hey, this is like a second birthday for me. So now I'm volunteering for Relay. I'm volunteering for AARP for uh, seminars. I volunteered for a uh, camp uh, for foster kids, and I just, I'm volunteering for everything. I love it. So the, I, I've, I've turned something really negative for me into something very, very positive. Right. Right. Yeah. It's in fact brought something to your life that it wouldn't, that you wouldn't have otherwise. Which is that's a hard reframe to make on on a hard day, you know, to think, oh, I'm grateful because now I have something that I wouldn't have had without this cancer. But on a good day, sometimes we can get there. Anybody else? I just, I just would like to reiterate uh, Tommy's point uh, here that we need to spend quality time with everyone. Um, I, uh, so one of my family members, um, he doesn't have cancer. He's my dad's brother. He is mentally not stable. And this happened for a silly reason that his friends pranked something and then he got affected and he never like um, became normal again. It's been like, I think, 30 to 40 years. Uh, it's very hard for our family, and he lives with us, and we all love him. We spend, we think we spend very qual quality time with him, but the problem here is he doesn't understand what we're doing for him. Like, he doesn't know. If it's, for example, like a kidney cancer or a different sort of cancer, they understand the quality time. They understand what we're doing for them. They live with us. You know, they do stuff normal. But if someone who doesn't, like, uh, understand what you're doing for them, we see them every day. He lives with us, but he doesn't know what we're doing. I think this is, this is very fortunate that um, we are all here, and it's important we need to spend quality time. And I personally think um, whether I have something or I don't have something, um, life is too short for me personally. So it's important to respect our family members, to understand the value of them, and give them enough time for them. That's my opinion. <clears throat> um, the disease aside, kind of hard to say that here, but, that, but let's put that aside for just a second. We don't know what's going to happen to any, any one of us at any time, right? We could get run over by a bus tomorrow. So that's, live that way. I don't know if that's denial, but just live that way. Live like you're going to be okay. You're going to do something good today, and maybe you'll get that chance again tomorrow. Any other thoughts? 
So, so one of the things that nobody has said that they do, but I happen to know that each and every one of you do, is you, you come here. You do this. You um, arm yourself with information. You uh, surround yourself with people who know what you're going through and who care about what, go what you're going through. And you come here and you hear the good things and the bad things. Um, and you take away from this, hopefully, only what's helpful and leave what's not. Um, but you engage with your life today. I don't know what you're going to do tomorrow, but I know today you're here engaging about this issue. So, I mean, I think that's a huge thing, too, that you're doing. So, basically, the point of this session, right, is to, one, not surprise yourselves and to know the hardest thing for you is, is probably the hardest thing for somebody else in here, too, um, because... Cancer can be very isolating, even if you have a great family, even if you've got great friends, even if you're 5, 10, 15 years out and you're doing great. Um, if nobody can stand there and understand that still on some days you're worried about what's going to happen to you more so than somebody who might just be getting more, you know, be worried about getting hit by a bus, um, that can, it, you can feel alone. So that's one of the points is that you're not, right? And, and Tommy said this in his talk, and this is sort of a theme of cancer care, right, is that, is that you're not alone. The other thing is to remind you that whatever that hardest thing is, you are living through it. It hasn't stopped you, right? And I'm sure that some days are much harder than others. And maybe today is a really good day. Maybe you feel empowered by all this information and you hear these people that say, they gave me six months and I'm here five years later and this is what's happening. And you walk out of here because you're, and you're, you're energized by that. Or maybe today is a hard day because it's all in your face, right? And all you've been talking about is cancer all day and how there's no cure and how we're doing our best and we're working really hard and we're trying to figure out what to do, but we still don't have the answer for you. So maybe it's a hard day, but tomorrow might be different. And no matter what that hardest thing is for you, even if you weren't willing to share it with me, but we're willing to share it with each other, <laughs> um, you're, you're living through it. Um, and seeing people come back here year after year, which I ha now have had the opportunity to do, tells me that you keep choosing to do it, right? Um, and nothing that I could say in a 45 minute or a 45 hour talk could take away uncertainty. You know, nothing I could say could make sure that you never suffer another moment of emotional hardship. But you have a place to bring some of this hard stuff and you have a place to bring good stuff. I hope that we see you back here again if this is useful for you. And if not, I hope that you find your place to bring your hard stuff and your good stuff so that you have equal places for both of it. And with that, I'm going to wrap us right up because I promised I would stop on time. Um, I work here, though, and I'm happy to talk with anybody at any point about pretty much anything. Um, so you guys can find me here through, through, the, through the clinic. Um, otherwise, just the fact that you have this resource tells me that you're connected somewhere. So keep on getting through the hardest thing, I guess. And um, I hope I will see you next year. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. That was awesome. Thank you. I think we are going to wrap up. I'd like to uh, thank a few people as well. I'd like to thank the Kidney Cancer Association for allowing us and helping us put up a conference like this. I want to thank all the speakers. Many of them aren't here, but Tommy and uh, Jordan, thank you for taking the time off your day to come here. I'd like to thank my team, my admin, Stephanie Mems, who did a lot to make this happen. Happen. I'd like to thank Joanne, Denise, and Shermin, who again took their day off to come and help us put a talk like this together. But most of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming here. Without you, we wouldn't be putting a program like this. And more important, sharing your uh, thoughts with us and helping all of us cope with this illness. So I hope to see you all again next year, and I hope you all have a wonderful and a safe journey with this disease for what it is. Thank you. Thank you.